Hey everybody, welcome back to History Student Reacts. Today we'll be watching Battle of Tour, How Did the Franks Turn the Islamic Tide by History March. Now this is a video that has been suggested to me, and it's on a very interesting and pretty consequential topic. It's a bit of medieval history, something we don't do too much of on this channel, but I do think it's an interesting topic. Now, if you would have liked to have seen this reaction early, then you should have subscribed either to my Patreon or my channel membership program, both of which can be found down below, both of which will give you early access to certain videos and access to exclusive content that you will not see publicly on the channel. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, let's jump right into this reaction. All right, Battle of Tours, 732 AD. It's a 10th October morning in the year of 732, and Charles Martel, leader of the Franks, shout- Charles Martel, aka Charles the Hammer. Now, Charla is a more accurate pronunciation, but I'm gonna lay off on the French pronunciation a little bit. <laughs> Just gonna pronounce things as an English speaker normally would. Apologies to any French viewers. It's a few words of encouragement to his men upon sighting the enemy. Closing in fast was an Umayyad wave of steel and swords set to crash against the dogged shield wall of their Frankish foes. The battle- And this is, just to give a brief bit of context before we really jump into it, this is such an interesting time in both European and sort of Middle Eastern Islamic history. At this point, you know, we still have the reign of the Umayyad Caliphate, though it is on its way out. So a big turning point for the Muslim world. And then, of course, this battle is a big turning point also for the Christian world. This is seen as basically the Christian Europeans turning back the Islamic tide, as the title of this video phrases it. So this is, you know, these couple of years really consequential for both the Christian and Islamic communities for the fate of Tour, and perhaps Christian Europe itself, was about to begin. Brought to you by Curiosity Stream. By the year 732, the dynamic Islamic faith had spread far from its Arabian heartland. Mm. Already by the mid-7th century, the new Umayyad Caliphate controlled an empire stretching from Khorasan in the east to Tripoli in the west. Yeah, and we've done a fair amount of videos on the early caliphates, particularly on the Rashidun and Umayyad Caliphates, though we've recently moved into looking at the Abbasids. And first off, just look at the extent of this massive, massive empire, and then remember, in only a couple of years, this thing is going to collapse. Now, it'll collapse into the Abbasid Caliphate, which is absolutely powerful and led to a new golden age of Islamic culture. But this in particular, this Umayyad Caliphate, doesn't have much longer to go. In 711, an alliance of North African Arab and Berber adventurers invaded the Visigothic Kingdom defeating King Roderick at the Battle of Guadalete and initiating the complete subjugation of Hispania within a few years. With Roderick slain, Aquila had assumed the crown, only to be driven into Septimania, which was in turn conquered by 719. Yeah, I mean, the Visigoths took a massive L. You know, you see them retreating, losing a massive amount of territory conquered quickly and effectively by these Muslims. The Caliphate's subjugation of Septimania now extended Umayyad control into the underbelly of the Frankish world and made Odo of Aquitaine especially anxious. Mm. Throughout 720, the Muslim governor of Al-Andalus, Al-Sam, consolidated his hold there, beginning the arduous siege of Visigothic holdout Carcassonne. The next year, Al-Sam launched a serious attempt at conquering Toulouse. And, you know, you can start to understand why this battle in particular is seen as so important. Look how far the Muslim forces have gone into Europe. I mean, they've conquered the entire Iberian Peninsula, or 
the vast, vast majority of the Iberian Peninsula, Peninsula, I should say for the sake of accuracy, and now they've crossed over the Pyrenees and are heading into Frankish territory. You can see why this is a big deal, and the Battle of Tours is basically an opportunity for these Christian Frankish forces to turn them back, which they do, but one could imagine, what if they didn't? You need to think what potentially could have been different, and of course, this is also sort of a big setup. You know, we're really leading up to the establishment of the Carolingian dynasty. You know, this new center and base of Frankish power. So some really interesting geopolitics occurring at this moment. But was defeated in a daring night attack outside the city. Prince Odo's desperate charge temporarily checking the Muslim advance. During this disaster, command of the Muslim remnants was taken by a certain Abd al-Rahman al-Gafiki. As his name suggests, al-Rahman was of the Gafiki clan, one of the elite Arab clans who had settled Al-Andalus some years before. Renowned as a man of generosity, piety, and courage, al-Rahman's prestige was also enhanced through his friendship with one of the sons of Umar himself who was the second of the so-called rightly guided caliphs. Yep, that immediate a popular fellow and remembered very well. He succeeded the prophet Muhammad. Though proving himself very capable of commanding in a crisis, Al-Rahman was replaced as governor by the senior North African governor, who saw him as too generous to the defeated men. Hmm. Al-Rahman's time would come, however. Between his brief and longer services as Wali of Al-Andalus, he instead ruled Septimania from Narbonne, close to the site of the battlefield of Toulouse. Mm. Before we continue, I want to welcome back my favorite sponsor and one that I use myself. Their favorite? Uh, as always, please check out this video by History March. Uh, go give them a like, check out their sponsor. Uh, you know, there are videos linked down below, so, you know, go show them support for making these fantastic videos. History Marsh. Big thanks to Curiosity Stream for sponsoring this video. It's now that we turn our attention north to the Frankish world. Yes, so we've covered Iberia, we've covered Al-Andalus, the Muslim conquest, how they're pushing further north. Now we reorient to the other side of this battle. The Franks, who are also, like I said, in an interesting position. Of course, this is looking ahead a bit, but we are building up to the establishment of the Carolingian dynasty, you know, this massive Frankish power base. So this is a real interesting time. Odo's triumph outside of Toulouse in 721 was certainly no unified Christian front against the Muslim invaders. Oh no. <laughs> Odo had petitioned Come on, you know, we always talk about, you know, the great Christian versus Muslim conflicts, the clash of civilizations, that's all well and good, but let's be honest, within each of these faiths, and here we're seeing an example from Christianity, they are fighting each other just as much, if not far more, than they're fighting people of other faiths. I mean, throughout the history of post-Roman Europe, it's Christians fighting other Christians, fighting other Christians, over and over and over, so this is a very common trend. The support of the de facto Frankish ruler, Charles Martel, but had ultimately been refused. And they say de facto Frankish ruler. The deal is, we have the Merovingian dynasty. Charles Martel uh, is not the king of this realm. He is a, what is called a mayor of the palace. In reality, he is the power behind the throne, and honestly, he's not even really behind the throne. He is the guy in charge. The king is a puppet, and, you know, very soon his son will establish his own dynasty, the Carolingians, and his grandson will be Charlemagne. <laughs> so we could see that power behind the throne very quickly becomes the power in front of the throne. So that's what they mean when they see when they say de facto and had to face the southern threat alone. Charles' refusal was symptomatic of the fragmented nature of the Frankish domain. 
Having united the Frankish mayoralities, the death of Charles's father, Pepin of Herstal, resulted in a civil war from which Charles ultimately emerged victorious. However, it was during this upheaval that in 714, Duke Odo of Aquitaine, nominally a Frankish vassal, declared himself prince of his own domain. Effectively independent from around 670 anyway, Aquitaine's borders had even expanded northwards during the Frankish decline. Yeah, and we have to remember, now this is absolutely not my time period of expertise. I'm really talking sort of out of my comfort zone, but, you know, we're in this era of a lot of different kingdoms and states and empires, a lot of infighting. I mean, at this point, it's been a couple hundred years since the fall of the Western Roman Empire. That big central authority is gone, and so it's been broken down. Now, when we see the emergence of the Carolingian Empire, that will be a massive empire in its own right. But what we're looking at at the moment is a lot of different states, a lot of rebellions, a lot of infighting, all that good stuff. Yet though Odo rivaled Charla as a power of the region, his ambitions were checked in 719, and an accord was reached whereby Charla recognized Odo's status in Aquitaine in exchange for custody of his ally, King Chilperic II, whom Charla used to legitimize his own rule as sole mayor, later reinforcing his own grip on power through the do-nothing king, Thierry IV. <laughs> yeah, you know, we have the actual kings who are do-nothing kings, don't actually do anything, versus Charles, who is a mayor of the palace, or we might call him a mayor, who is the one actually in charge of all this politics. Meanwhile, in Al-Andalus, tensions between Berber and Arab Muslims would spill over into bloodshed and provided the basis for the Al-Rahman's incursion into Aquitaine. Mm. And we see in the bottom right corner, Berber Muslims were taxed heavily and despite conversion, treated as second class and often even enslaved. Now that enslaved part, that is especially extreme, but the idea that non-Arabic Muslims even after they've converted to Islam, to be perfectly clear, are treated as second-class citizens and even taxed heavily, that is a theme we've seen in many videos about uh, the early caliphates and one of the re-emerging issues that had to be faced time and time again. The following year. Far from a harmonious polity, the Muslims of Al-Andalus were arguably as fractured as their northern foes. Oh yeah. Tensions between the minority... Maybe not as fractured, but they're saying the point that I made earlier, which is we talk a lot about Christians versus Muslims, but there is a lot of infighting, you know, inside these faiths. Muslims versus Muslims, Christians versus Christians. Authority Arab elite and Berbers, both of whom constituted the Muslim ruling class, had simmered beneath the surface and... After hearing of the oppression of his fellow Berbers in North Africa, the regional governor, Manusa, threw off Umayyad control. Hmm. Manusa thought it prudent to form a pact of friendship with the equally embattled Odo on his border. This alliance was sealed through the marriage of the Berber to Odo. And so sometimes Muslims would side with Christians and Christians would side with Muslims in order to rebel against leaders or people of their own faith. How about that? <laughs> Who's illegitimate but beautiful daughter. Oh. For Al-Rahman, Manusa's pact with an enemy bordering his lands could not go unanswered. Mm. He also likely felt he had unfinished business with Manusa's new ally too, and it seems that Al-Rahman began planning his push into Aquitaine from the time of his second accession as governor. All right. From 730 to 732, Al-Rahman toured his province, engaging in the usual duties of his office, while he had also commanded his army to coalesce at Pamplona. Al-Rahman's force may have numbered from 15 to 20,000 men, though this is one of the more hotly Whoa. debated areas of this campaign. Back north, far from... Yeah. They say in the bottom right corner this number might be enlarged given many families of the soldiers accompanied the army, but for this time period, 
For medieval Europe, that is a very sizable army. Concerned at the build-up of Umayyad power across the Pyrenees, Charles Martel was more worried about a meeting between the ex-mayor of Neustria and Odo, which he feared may lead up to an alliance against him. Meanwhile, in the same year, Muslim raiders penetrated as far as Burgundy. And, you know, we've already talked a little bit about this earlier in the video, and we'll get to it again later. Of course, this battle is significant because it, has see it is seen as Christian Europe putting a halt to Muslim expansion, but it's also remarkable. You can see how far deep Muslim raiders were getting into Western Europe. Um, and of course, <laughs> this is a region that we don't particularly think of as very Islamic, uh, especially during the Middle Ages, you know, the highly Christian Western Europe. But look how far these Muslim raiders are getting. Now, imagine if they had been able to continue past the Battle of Tours. I mean, you know, you only need to look a little bit south to see the Iberian Peninsula, Al-Andalus, which has been conquered by these Muslims, who is to say they couldn't go further in. At this moment, it looks like exactly that is happening. Nominally under Charles' control, and even seized and burnt down the rich city of Utah. Charles evidently took the threat of Odo far more seriously that year, as he twice attacked northeastern Aquitaine in warning. Mm. Traversing the Loire, the Carolingian army captured and looted Bourges, though Odo swiftly retook it. In the south, probably during summer or early autumn of 731, Al-Rahman moved to crush Manusa. Moving into the rebel governor's province, he defeated his army, took his main stronghold, and then cornered Manusa himself in the mountains, Odo's ally throwing himself from a cliff to avoid capture. Wow. In either May or early June of 732, the Muslim army finally moved into Aquitaine, moving not through the usual eastern route, but via the west. Hmm. This brought Al-Rahman's army squarely into the heartland of Odo's power, and all- Yeah, Odo's on the borderlands. You know, let's see what he does. ...so avoided the Toulouse region, where his predecessor had met such a sticky end. <laughs> Al-Rahman's main body headed determinedly north towards Bordeaux, while smaller parties fanned off to devastate the lands between the Pyrenees and Garonne. And once again, it is just crazy to think of the Islamic Caliphate coming into contact with, say, Bordeaux, <laughs> a city that we think of as so firmly European, just to me at least in such a different context than the Caliphate, but it really is a good reminder of how quickly and how far the Muslim Caliphate expanded. I mean, in only a couple decades, we are talking about stretching all the way from the Indian subcontinent through, well, through the Middle East, through North Africa, and into modern-day Spain and Portugal, and now into modern-day France, firmly into the Frankish kingdoms. You know, it's just a good reminder of how expansive the caliphate at this time truly was, and I imagine from a certain perspective, from both the Muslim perspective and, say, the Frankish perspective, it might have seemed like this caliphate's unstoppable. <laughs> I mean, they've expanded so far, how on earth could that expansion be stopped here? That expansion will be stopped here, but at this point, it might seem kind of unlikely. Meeting scant resistance. In answer, Odo assembled his force of Gascons and Basque militia, fixing themselves along the river Garonne. And, well, I mean, Odo has a chance to stop it right now. Let's see if he can. Perhaps recalling his great victory 11 years before, Odo remained outside of his capital, preferring instead to meet his foes in the field. However, unlike at Toulouse, he was defeated. Seizing Bordeaux itself, the Muslim host showed little mercy, burning any church they found and slaying many inhabitants. Damn. Such a prize also substantially increased their collective hoard of loot. Al-Rahman now moved to finish Odo himself, meeting the Aquitani force once more 
and wiping out most of his army. With little option, Odo fled north with his remaining followers to seek the aid of another enemy. Now would you look at that! Odo has been in conflict with Charles this whole time, but now he's been put into a desperate situation, he has no option. He got beaten by one enemy, and fortunately, Odo, you have to go side with another. And now look, at this point, you know, I talk about the perspective of the era, and, you know, if we just imagine ourselves looking at this from that perspective, not knowing what's to come, it must seem somewhat unlikely that the expansion would be stopped here, especially when we think of the European polities of the era. I mean, there is no European kingdom that even comes close to comparing to the size, the strength, the power of the Caliphate. I mean, in only its first couple of years, the Caliphate managed to completely destroy the Persian Empire and take a massive chunk of territory from the Eastern Roman Empire. What chance did the Franks have of resisting the infighting, split-up Franks? who, you know, can't stop fighting amongst each other to even establish their base of power. It must seem like, from that perspective, they are facing a much, much stronger foe in these Muslims. Encountering Shala at Rams, the Frankish ruler responded by mustering his own army from all three of his realms. Marching to Orléans, Shala crossed the River Loire via Ambrose, and to his relief found the city of Tours within his own territory, untouched. Okay. With the defeat of Odo, Al-Rahman's army split off and raided the wider region for around three months before reassembling at the gutted Saints and heading ominously for the rich city of Poitiers. Hmm. Poitiers itself was surrounded by walls. However, the place had large unfortified suburbs that left it vulnerable the Umayyads sacking and looting the Abbey Church of Saint-Hilaire. Mm. Already heavily laden with loot, Al-Rahman's army bypassed the fortified city itself and made north for the more vulnerable and even richer Abbey Church of Saint-Martin, outside the city of Tours. Yet, if the Muslim warriors looked greedily forward to this substantial increase in their riches, then they were to be sorely disappointed. Gonna be honest, I didn't know there was so much wealth floating around in the Frankish kingdoms at this time. That's a bit surprising to me. Having been halted close to crossing the Vienne by the advancing Franks, the Muslim army pulled back to a defensive position, establishing their camp between the rivers on or around the 18th of October. And I believe this battle is... I mean, it's known as the Battle of Tours. It's sometimes also referred to as the Battle of Poitiers, uh, in reference to the city that was just bypassed. It's generally agreed that a period of standoff ensued. Indeed, it's likely that Charles' army was encamped on the opposite bank of the Vienne for some days, and eventually crossed to make their own camp north of our modern-day hamlet. Mm. Sporadic skirmishing took place in the build-up to the main day of battle. The Frankish force fielded that day consisted of many grizzled veterans of Charles' earlier campaigns, as well as less experienced militia units. Yeah, I'm sure. I mean, we've got a lot of warrior cultures at this time. I mean, the Caliphate, with its quick and rapid expansion, is certainly a warrior culture. Uh, they're doing a lot of raids, a lot of expansion. You know, that fighting spirit is a big part of the Caliphate's identity at this period. And I would imagine that for a lot of these Franks, they also have that same warrior spirit. I mean, this is a pretty dangerous time to be alive. There's a lot of infighting. There isn't a lot of strong central authority to make it to rise up. You have to do a lot of fighting, a lot of combat. So... I imagine we've got some real warriors going at each other right now, some real grizzled and hardened veterans on both sides. Almost exclusively an infantry force, the army did, however, have a small cavalry arm, led by Odo himself. And there's another typical difference. Cavalry is far more prominent for the Caliphate, for the Muslims. Um, they had a... Uh, much stronger cavalry force. The reformer used to using that cavalry, 
whereas the Europeans, uh, the Franks in this case, would rely far more on their infantry. In contrast, the Umayyad army was largely mounted, more mobile and better equipped. Mm. As per the usual Umayyad practice, their camp would have been in a relatively secure location, most likely on some high ground a little off and surrounded by woods. Though, as events will show, it was not as secure as to be invulnerable to attack. Oh. The Umayyad army was also likely formed in the traditional five divisions of a center, two wings, as well as a vanguard and rear guard. Given it is highly unlikely the Umayyad camp was left undefended, the Muslim rear guard was likely either close to or at the camp itself. Early on the morning of October... And look at the composition of these armies. I know I just pointed it out, but we have this Muslim force that appears to be entirely or almost entirely cavalry-based, which once again was pretty typical. And then a Frankish force, which once again pretty typical, is primarily predominantly infantry with a small cavalry force. Now, those small cavalry forces could be pretty instrumental, but it's pretty remarkable to see the very different breakdown of these two forces. 25th, the Umayyad army once again arrayed for battle, and this time attacked the solid Frankish ranks. Charla must have been aware that his greatest chance of survival was to withstand these attacks. Mm. The repeated Muslim charges smashed bloodily against the Franks, with Al-Rahman ordering probing assaults at particular points of perceived weakness. Yet, despite these repeated charges, and perhaps some initial fragmentation of parts of the Frankish line, Charles Franks held firm. All right. I mean, look, that's going to be a big part of this battle. How much can these Frankish troops hold up? Can they hold strong? Because in a battle like this, especially if you're looking at the composition of these two armies, I would usually say that the cavalry force has an advantage against an overwhelmingly infantry-dominated force. So these troops, they are going to have to stand incredibly strong, weather the storm until they can wear their enemy out or find some other path to victory. However, the same could not be said for the Umayyad invaders. Sometime during the early afternoon, Odo, likely leading a small contingent of cavalry, yep. rode around the main melee in a wide flanking attack on the Muslim camp. Odo's attack managed to penetrate the Muslim camp, slaughtering many non-combatants, and yet he was not able to completely overrun it. Damn. As aforementioned, it's almost certain that the camp offered serious resistance, the Umayyad rear guard probably preventing a total slaughter, though the overall damage had already been done in another way. Well, that's exactly right. Odo doesn't completely manage to overrun the camp. Maybe not as successful as he would have liked to be, but just the fact that he made it around and dealt serious damage to the camp in the first place that's a big, big deal, and of course, that is a big problem for the Muslim force. Back at the main clash, word spread through the Umayyad ranks that the camp itself was being attacked. Mm -hmm. And perhaps having little choice, Al-Rahman ordered a general withdrawal. And so I'm liking these notes down in the corner. So there's first off the fact that Berbers customarily brought family with them on campaign, though it's unclear if this was the case here. So there might have been a family element at play, we don't really know, and there also might have been a lot of concern about the loss of loot. I mean, we talked about how much loot this army had picked up while it was gallivanting around these Frankish kingdoms. Maybe a lot of these cavalrymen were worried about having none of their loot to take back home. Once again, we don't know concretely, but these are some of the reasons it might have been even more concerning than usual that the camp was under attack. To check Odo's assault there. Seizing the moment, Charla launched his own full-scale counterattack, reaching the Muslim camp and engaging Al-Rahman and his men once more. Mm. At this stage, the second breakthrough of the battle came with the fall of the Umayyad commander himself. Wow. 
This, however, did not precipitate a disorderly collapse or rout. Okay. As even so, the Muslim warriors did manage to push back the Franks. It's pretty impressive to hold on even after your commander has been killed, and especially Al-Rahman seems like he was a pretty talented, intelligent guy, at least from what we're seeing here. Uh, he seems to have been a successful governor, a good leader, so for someone like that to fall in the midst of battle, uh, that can be quite a disaster in a lot of different circumstances. Indeed, it was Sharla who ordered a general withdrawal back to his own camp as the evening darkened, though he left a Muslim host battered and now leaderless. Mm. As morning dawned, the Frankish leader once more determinedly arrayed his warriors for battle, but this time, no fighting ensued. Wow. The Umayyad army had taken the opportunity to withdraw in good order. I mean, that makes a lot of sense, right? They've already made their way pretty deep into Western Europe. They've picked up a lot of loot. They've just fought this battle. It didn't go super well for them, and they've lost their commander. Why don't you cut and run now? <laughs> you could still, you know, escape in an orderly manner. It doesn't have to be a total disaster, and you can get your asses out of there <laughs> without everything falling apart. During the night, having left their camp intact, as well as their prisoners and a hefty stash of loot. Ooh, of course, loot. that's uh, that's got to be a tough loss, but sometimes you do have to make those tough decisions. Let's leave a little bit of loot behind so that we can get ourselves out of here. The loan was sufficient to stymie any serious pursuit of the invaders, as well as a general lack of cavalry. Yeah. Charla himself withdrew north via Orléans, content to allow Odo to clean up the smaller Muslim groups that remained. All right. The Battle of Tours thus concluded not so much on the tail end of an annihilation, but in a checking of the main Muslim advance. Char yeah, maybe not as dramatic or climactic a battle as one might have imagined. And it does sort of lead you to the question, you know, had this battle gone differently, how would the history have changed? You know, would the Muslims have kept advancing into Western Europe? Would they have been able to conquer even wider? To be honest with you, I'm not entirely sure. There's a lot of events that occur around this time. You know, Charles Martel really establishing his base of power, the emergence of the Carolingian dynasty, the collapse of the Umayyad Caliphate, you know, there were a lot of much broader geopolitical events that would seem to have more of an impact on what exactly is happening on the ground. Though, once again, I must clarify, I am no medieval historian, so someone with a little more expertise on the topic might be able to give you a better idea of how much of an impact this event actually had. Allah had prevented Al-Rahman's host from reaching the Abbey of San Martans and scored an unambiguous and famous victory over the Umayyad Caliphate. Yeah, I will tell you what this victory did definitely do. It definitely further increased the reputation of Charles Martel. Not that he was doing bad beforehand, but this was definitely a win for him. However, the Muslim presence in Francia was hardly a... Umayyads were finally expelled from Narbonne in 759 AD by Charles' son, King Pepin the Short, uh, you know, who also established that Carolingian dynasty. After a long fight, the Arabs and Berbers were forced out of Septimania. Okay, so that's, that's more of a cutoff point than this even though I think the Battle of Tours is far more widely known and is seen to have this great, great importance and significance. Eradicated. The Umayyads would remain a continuing presence in the region well past the lifetime of Charla, with oh, yeah. Charla's son Pepin finally driving them out of Narbonne some years later. However, Odo accepted his vassalage to Charles, his successors were less obliging, and only during the reign of his illustrious grandson, who we mentioned earlier, Charlemagne, was the region truly subdued. That's why I say, you know, it was Charles' son, Pepin, who really established this Carolingian dynasty, which was then truly cemented at its furthest extent under Charlemagne, and then, of course, we know after the death of Charlemagne, things started to break down again. Though contained to Al-Andalus, the long Reconquista south of Charles' domain 
would endure for centuries yeah, to come. Yeah, long, very long. If you stayed around this far, All right. thank you for watching. Great video, an interesting one. And when they say long reconquista, they really mean long. I mean, they talked about there how Muslims would remain a presence in the region for a while, but then even after they're sort of pushed out of Francia, they remain a presence in the Iberian Peninsula for centuries and centuries to go. So it's not like the Muslim presence instantly disappeared, and I do think that the importance of this battle is often over-exaggerated, but I think that's often how we look at history. We see these monumental changes, these trends over time, and to make it easy, we pick one event, one battle, that may or may not have that level of significance and assign it that significance. We say, all right, we're going to associate this with the Muslims being pushed out of Francia, even though it was, of course, a broader process than that. But still, some really interesting stuff. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you did, please leave a like, subscribe. Uh, once again, if you would have liked to have seen this video early, then you could have seen it early on the Patreon or as a channel member, both of which you can find down below. Anyway, with all of that out of the way, I hope you guys are having a good day today, and I will see you all again next time. Goodbye.